my name is Denise Lindemann, and I am one of the members here at Desert Grace. We have a great message for you today. If you enjoy this video, be sure to give us a thumbs up and leave a comment so that we know you've been blessed. God bless you and have a great day. I'm pretty convinced that everybody in the whole wide world has done something crazy. And oftentimes when we do something crazy, it's for a crazy reason. So I was thinking about some of the things that uh, people say that they do that they think are kind of crazy. And uh, I wondered if maybe you could relate. For example, have you ever turned the car radio down? You know, like you are driving and, you know, maybe there's traffic or something and you need to turn the car radio down in order that you might see better. I know some of you do this next one. Whenever you go into the bathroom, you kind of turn the shower curtain a little bit and peek back there because you just never know when there might be a serial killer standing there ready to strike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some of you are willing to be honest. This next one is kind of a, a more serious one, but you know that we as people generally don't like any time that we feel marginalized, but sometimes I am confident that you have felt hated and victimized. And absolutely, it bothers you so much that it's just a, a serious situation. Because when your phone won't work and you are trying so hard, it's personal. Just so you know, your phone, your computer, your printer, whatever technology you happen to think is against you, has no feelings. <laughs> Maybe you were asked to do something crazy, and that's why you were finding yourself doing something that you wouldn't normally otherwise do. And, and back in the days when I used to be a test driver, I was way down in southern Arizona, about as far from the proving ground as you could possibly get when the car lost power. Hey, there's nobody really driving on this highway. It's like between Nogales and Bisbee or Douglas. And I'm thinking, you know what? It's going to be a while, and I hope I have enough cell signal. And I finally make it through. I call the, the supervisor and he says, all right, well, I know how to fix this problem. You need to turn the car off. You need to get out and walk around. Lock the car when you get out of the car. Walk around the car, get back in, it'll start up and you'll have no problems. If you do, call me back. You began to wonder, is there a camera? It worked. I'm wondering if you ever felt like God was calling you to do something crazy. I mean, really, if we want to talk about it in the world's terms, what the world thinks we ought to do, so many of the things that God asks us to do just sound crazy. Give away some of your time to help the church and to tell other people about Jesus. Give away some of your money. Give away your Sunday morning when, like most people, it's the one day they can sleep in. At least that's the excuse I hear the most often. I'd love to come to church, Pastor, but Sunday is the only day I have to sleep in. Great. YouTube.com slash Desert Grace. Or what is it, desertgrace.online.church? I don't remember that one anymore. Just go to desertgrace.org and, and click live stream. You can stay in your pajamas. It's all right. My question for us today is what do we learn when God calls a prophet to take actions that appear crazy? Because God does occasionally call us and call people in the Bible to do things that don't sound normal that don't sound right, that sometimes don't even sound within God's character. One such example of this would be the prophet Hosea. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that when he was listening to God and hearing what God was saying, his crazy factor on what God was asking went really sky high. 
And I thought about this a little bit, and I said, you know what? Is it really so crazy when God is the one asking? Yep. Hosea 1, chapter 1, verses 2. We're going to read all the way through the first verse of chapter 2. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go and marry a promiscuous woman and have kids with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Deblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her Lo Ruhama, which means not loved. For I will no longer show love to Israel, that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to Judah, and I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses and horsemen. But I, the Lord their God, will save them. After she had weaned, not loved, Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, call him Lo Ami, which means not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted, and the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will come together. They will appoint one leader and they will come up out of the land for great will be the day of Jezreel. Say of your brothers, my people, and of your sisters, my loved one. So, interesting requests. Here's the thing. Hosea receives in that small passage four separate commands or four different calls of things he was supposed to do. And the first one is to marry a wild woman. Woohoo! <laughs> now, I don't know where you stand on this or what you're thinking when you hear this sort of thing, but I, I just seem so out of character for God to say, hey, go find an adulterous woman. Go find somebody who's promiscuous. Go find somebody who's absolutely just, you know, not faithful to you and marry that woman. Hmm. I want to kind of point something out here. Back in Hosea's time, marriage and family, that's what most people did. And it was kind of essential, really, to survive. So a prohibition against him getting married would be unique. So it's not surprising that, that God says to Hosea, get married. What's surprising is that instead of get married and here's the woman, he says, find yourself a promiscuous one. An adulterous woman, because she will be like the Israelites are. There is one specific example where a prophet is told not to get married. That would be Jeremiah. Now, this next one is a little bit PG-13, but you can handle it. To be promiscuous is certainly to be engaged in sex outside of marriage. The, the original Hebrew makes no qualifications or, or, or sort of maybe it means something else then. The problem is, is that so often sex and idolatry is intertwined in that age. So that in other words, anytime you leave God, you get involved in a cult which, in which sex is a part of what's going on. It seems important for us to make sure that we wrap our head around this. Because basically what God is saying is you need to go find somebody who has the character of a promiscuous woman. He doesn't say she already has to be out there just, you know, like go to one of the, the idol worship centers and find yourself a woman who's just absolutely engaged with all kinds of activity there, and then she would be your wife. He, he just says find somebody with this character. But it's also really clear that, he, not so much in the English, but in the Hebrew, that he's not saying, go find a prostitute. The promiscuous and the prostitute are two separate words. And so if what he wanted was her to marry specifically a prostitute, he could have easily said so. Go find yourself a prostitute and marry her. 
So this idea is really that not so much that this woman is unfaithful in the moment, but somebody who will ultimately become unfaithful. Then he says there's to be children. Now, there's a temptation when we read this to have children of promiscuity to begin to think that this could possibly mean that you need to have children who are are obtained outside of the wedding vow. But the scripture also would have had an opportunity to say that, that you're going to have some children that aren't yours, that, that this should be something that you should expect. There's absolutely nothing in what we read that implies that Hosea's children will be illegitimate. Not a single thing. In fact, it doesn't really ever imply where the children came from. But it also tells us that all of these actions are going to be symbolic of the actions of God's people. Now, scholars will get kind of mixed ideas of, you know, did did Hosea really hear this the way he heard it, or is he kind of looking back and seeing what God had done? Is that really what what the, the order is? I don't want to get too caught up in those weeds. I want to make sure that we understand that what what is going on here is that God is beginning to say to us and to the Israelites through Hosea that this is a symbol essentially of how we treat God. That we are the idolatrous or the, the unfaithful spouse. Now, we're told, just sort of as a matter of fact, that Hosea marries Gomer, and Gomer begins to bear the children. Now, I don't know if you're at all like me. Sometimes you're kind of wishing for a little more details. How did he find her? How did he know? (laughs) know, All those sorts of things. But really what we see in the very first beginning of the the entire um, book is just kind of a line of who... Uh, Hosea is, and then he's called. And the fact that he goes and marries Gomer is basically saying he's fulfilling what God told him to do. So scholars start to think, hey, what does it mean, this name of Gomer, or what does the de blame mean? And scholars have come to an interesting conclusion. It doesn't mean anything with her name. It's just that basically what the point is, is that Hosea did what God called him to do. So first command, God did it. He did what he was supposed to do. The second thing that happens is God tells him, you are to name your first child, who happens to be a boy, may God sow. Now, I don't know. Seems like a weird name, but you know, we kind of had a conversation about that in a previous sermon series, so I won't go too much into that. But may God sow doesn't necessarily sound like it's something that is negative. What exactly is God sowing? Is he sowing something beautiful or is he sowing something destructive? Is, is this about redemption or is this about judgment? Those are two very important questions we could ask. So Jezreel is this name. It means God may sow. But also Jezreel is a place. It is a city, but it is also a valley near the city, and it's where some pretty serious atrocities were committed by the Israelites. They have a bad kind of connotation with it. And so basically, you end up seeing this uh, situation where you have a city or an area in which bad things happened, which means that we probably should be expecting God to be sowing bad things through an adulterous woman who's not faithful. One of the challenges here is that at one point, Jehu is fighting against his oppressors, and he has a massacre, he commits a massacre at Jezreel. But one of the problems is that Israel has become the oppressor. You see, one of the challenges is that sometimes we feel oppressed, and then we want to go and make sure that we're not being oppressed, and in doing so, we oppress others. I can go through example after example of that, but even though the timer started late, I don't have time for it. To break the bow is to completely destroy any military strength. So when we get to this point of, hey, listen, 
God is going to destroy the bow in the valley of Jezreel, what he's saying is he's going to completely wipe out Israel's power, Israel's strength, Israel's might. Now, think about how Israel ends up here. To begin with, you understand that they're in the promised land. And they got there because God paved the way and fought for them. Now, he's basically saying he's not going to do anything for them. He's basically telling them that not only is there going to be complete destruction, I'm not just going after a single king, I'm going after the entire kingdom. Israel was actually going through this really rough time in Hosea's time, which there were kings that one of them died and another one took power and within a few months he's assassinated and another one makes it for a few months and gets assassinated and, and all of these essentially illegitimate kings are taking over. And so part of what Hosea is doing is saying, hey, listen, all of this foolishness, it's not just about your king. It's about all of you as the children of God. So apparently Hosea names his second son Jezreel, or God will sow. The next command or call that he gets is to name his second child. This one happens to be a girl. No compassion or not loved. Interesting sort of way to name your children. Um, today, they would probably like, take you to court over something like this. You lose custody of your child. This is my kid. I hate her. <laughs> right? Yeah. I want to make sure we get something, because really we're seeing here that, that God has chosen Gomer to be sort of the example of who we happen to be like, who Israel is like. But he's choosing through the children to kind of show what's coming. So there's going to be destruction in Jezreel or the valley of Jezreel. Now we're going to see that God is no longer loving Israel. He's taking his compassion essentially away from them. So no longer is he going to just say, look, you just keep doing the wrong thing, but I'm just going to keep giving you the blessing of living in the promised land or continuing to do what you're supposed to do. This name is kind of a symbol of what's coming up, what's going to happen, that, that God is ultimately going to reject Israel, that there's going to be wrath poured down on them and, and essentially a curse because they have not followed God the covenant. Now, we need to understand something here. We know Israel is God's chosen people, his family, the people he loves. He's entered into a covenant with them. They have done some of what they were supposed to do, but they have continuously wandered away. This is a change in status of Israel's very being. They are going from being God's chosen people to becoming not loved, no compassion on them, not because of God just suddenly said, you know what, I've, I've changed my mind, but because they have been disloyal to God. And we know God to be a loving God, and we know that God is... He is so loving that he's reckless with his love, right? And yet here he says, if you aren't going to follow me, I can't continue to love you. I can't continue to show you the blessings. Now, there's a verse in there, verse 7, suggests that only the northern kingdom will be destroyed. Now, you remember there was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. We're going to have a little history lesson. The northern one, Israel, the southern one, Judah. And so this is really a threat against the northern kingdom. And you'll find toward the end of, of Hosea's time that the northern kingdom is taken over by the Assyrians. It'll come much later for the southern kingdom. But here it seems like, oh, well, the northern kingdom, you guys are gone. The southern kingdom, you guys are going to, good luck. Blessings to you, I guess. So now we find that they have a change in status. Gomer weans... <laughs> No compassion or not loved. Typically, that was around age three back then. 
and she has a third child, and that gives God his fourth command to Hosea. And this one, a son, is to be named, not my people. It's complete. Gomer, whose name really doesn't mean anything, but she's a symbol of the unfaithfulness of Israel. To Jezreel, which is God will sow, and something bad is coming. There's a judgment coming. To not loved or no compassion, God is pulling his compassion to now not my people. It's complete. This is essentially God divorcing himself from Israel, not wanting to have anything to do with them since they are so disloyal from what he is doing. And by the way, God withdrawing is the only option when we are disobedient or rebellious. I mean, God probably could just say, all right, fine. Bang, you have to follow what I say. Get rid of that whole free will thing. But he doesn't want to, I'm convinced. So he says, look, I want you to choose me, but when you don't choose me, what choice does God have? If you are out committing a, a heinous sin, is God standing there going, well, I wish you wouldn't do this, but I love you anyway? Or is God saying, I cannot be a part of this? Which means I have to pull my protection from you. And whatever should happen to happen will happen. Not because I don't love you, but because I can't be a part of what's going on. You see, when you break a covenant, a swift, a swift reaction is required. God must take some sort of action. He can't just sit there and go, well, they don't love me anymore, but we'll just keep our end up. I'm convinced that so often humanity wants the benefits of a covenant with God, but they don't want the obedience that comes with it. That essentially what we want is to, to be able to do whatever we want to do, but still have God to bless us and to do whatever God wants to do to make us happy. Now, I want to kind of mention this. You probably have thought this through already, but the names of the children are going to be a constant reminder of God's upcoming actions. Imagine Hosea. I, I don't think that Hosea would have introduced himself as, this is my promiscuous wife, my child Jezreel, God will sow, there's a judgment coming. And then the second one, we don't love her, she's not loved. No, we love her, but she's not loved, she, no compassion. And that third one's not my people. But my guess is that if you were an Israelite and you happened to speak to Hosea and say, so introduce me to your family, he'd be saying, all right, well, here's my wife, Gomer. Here is uh, Jezreel. Here is not loved or no compassion. And here's not my people. And they would be saying, did you hate all of your children before you had them? And he would say, no, these are the names God told me to give. You see, the message would have been so clear coming from Hosea. If we don't do something different, we're going to keep getting what we're getting. And what we're getting right now is unfaithfulness to God. And so God does something a little crazy, and he says, look, Marry a promiscuous woman. Name your kids these really weird names that when people hear them, they're going to be like, oh, what is that all about? And you'll be able to explain it to them. I'm not sure how much that message ever got through. I'm not sure how, how much they would have understood it. But the kids basically become the message. So what do we learn when God calls a prophet to take actions that appear kind of crazy. When we begin to see that God is up to something, but we're not exactly sure what God is up to. I think the first part of this answer is one that ought to concern all of us. Because I think that what we really learn is that if we're going to be honest with ourselves, we are Gomer in this story. And we all tend to wander away from God. 
Now, I'm not saying that you're way far from God today. But if you've been a Christian or a Christ follower for very long, you have experienced at some point in your time the, the sort of pull to do something else. And sometimes we do a really good job at saying, no, I'm not going to do that, and still taking on another God. Because I'm telling you, there are millions of people who claim to be Christ followers. If everyone who claimed to be a Christ follower in the United States showed up to church in one day, there would not be enough seats in all the churches in the United States to hold them all. In fact, we would have to have two or three services. All the churches would have to have two or three services to make it work. And yet, people think, hey, I'm doing good. God and I are friends. We're going to talk a little bit more about Hosea and Gomer and, and his message is in the coming weeks, but... I want us to really understand today that if we understand nothing else, that when Hosea takes Gomer, a promiscuous woman, as his wife, it's really the definition of God accepting us with the reckless love that he gives us. There's no doubt about it. I want to tell you that no matter what, God is calling you to take steps that other people would look at and say, that is crazy. God calls people to do some of the most incredibly crazy things on his behalf. And the question is, when he does, what do we do with the calling he's given us? Are we willing to be crazy because that's what God has asked us to do? Or is that one of the moments when we say, you know, God, could you, could you find somebody else? Because God seems like he's one who really demands a crazy amount from us. I've thought about this an awful lot. I think one of the problems is, is that we look at some of God's commands and, and we as a, as a people, I'm not talking about this specific church or people in this specific church, but we as a people have wanted to start redefining what God has said in order so that it would be more comfortable to us. Do you think when God says, hey, here's an idea, and give a percentage back that you have received from me? Because what I give you actually belongs to me to begin with. Hmm. That sounds pretty crazy, especially when we know, hey, we earned that money. But what about when God says, hey, there is a work day, Saturday, Jesse's closet. <laughs> okay, so some of you are like, well, 8.30, really? That's kind of early. It's my one day to sleep in, besides Sunday. <laughs> Some of you are going 90 minutes in a warehouse, really? Some of you are like, party sounds like fun, but what if so-and-so is there? I don't really like so-and-so. Oh no, not in our church, I'm sorry, got confused. God makes some interesting demands on us. And if God's not calling you to be there Saturday at 8.30 at Jesse's Closet for about 90 minutes for a party, or ending in a party, that's all right. If God says, don't go, don't go. But if God says go, he'd better show up or you're unfaithful. I know, now I've really put a damper on the whole thing. We are often lured into the world's way of thinking. And when we are, we tend to disobey, to distrust, and to outright rebel against God. The world is telling you to do something different. The world is telling you that the church is, is demanding too much of you and telling you the fact that God doesn't really exist. That's what the world tells you. 
You see people, leaders, who sometimes don't even continue to follow what God wants them to say, and they make all these reasons why they can't or shouldn't. And sometimes they just say, did God really mean that? The problem is he did. Are you able to say that you are faithful in all of the areas of your life? Are you able to say that, that you follow God in everything that he's asking you to do? Or is there a temptation for you to wander around? Do you acknowledge that you have that temptation? And if you honestly really don't have that temptation, talk to me because we need to get you up here and speak and tell the rest of us how you do it. Second thing that we learn from the passage this morning and what Hosea has to say is we learn that God always holds out hope for redemption, especially for every gomer in humanity. In other words, we may be gomer in the story. But if you caught it there at the end of the passage is the story of redemption, the story of hope, the story that what God really wants is restoration. Pay attention to those verses 10 through 12, which basically say this, the Israelites as God's people will continue. They're being numerous. They're going to gather together. They're going to be under one king. By the way, do you wonder who that one king is? I was worried about you guys there for a minute. You're like, who? Jesus. Christ. There's hope for redemption. What more could you ask? And by the way, if you didn't notice already, the kids get new names. Verses 10, verse 10 and a half says, in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. Right. Yes. Woohoo! Remember Jezreel? May God sow. Is this going to be a good thing or is this going to be a bad, bad thing? Verse 11 says, the day of Jezreel will be great. Now, trust me, if it's destruction and the gnashing of teeth and sulfur fire from heaven coming down, I don't think God's going to describe it as great. They'll be gathered together under one king and they'll burn up. No, 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 no. And then, verse 1 of chapter 2, you'll call your brothers my people and your sisters my loved ones. Do you see how the kids' names get reversed? Jezreel as, as the sign of destruction, the place and the time. No compassion will become loved. My loved one, not my people, will become my people. You guys are not nearly as excited. You should be standing up, jumping up and down by now. I just want to say this one thing. The hope of reconciliation is not a license of disobedience, for disobedience or disloyalty. It's a promise of redemption and one that I believe we already are living in the age of. Where are you in the story of Gomer and Hosea? Would you put yourself closer to the unfaithful spouse? the one who isn't doing what you really ought to be doing? Or would you put yourself at the side of redemption? There's a little bit of a danger there because when you get to the side of redemption, one of the challenges is, is that we still want to wander away. And become Gomer all over again. Where are you in the story? Or maybe more appropriately, are you ready for crazy? For what God is going to call you to do. 
what God wants to do through you as his loved, his compassion on, his people. Where are you? And what are you ready to do? Heavenly Father, I think if we're going to be honest to, to ourselves, some of us would have to admit that we're a little closer to the unfaithful spouse than we are to completely redeemed and, and totally in line with your word. For anybody that's in that position this morning, Lord, call them to you. Bring them in. Show them your love. Show them your compassion. Show them that you have a plan for their life no matter how crazy it may sound or no, no matter what crazy thing you have in store for them. We hear stories all the time of, of people who, who, who had a great career or had something absolutely wonderful going for them and then you get a hold of them and change their entire life. not because of any other reason, but because of you've taken them from wanting to wander and serve a different God to truly serving you. And my concern for us as a congregation, both individually and as a whole, is that we would be unfaithful to what you have called us to do. Because Lord, I know that there's something that every person in here and every person listening to the sound of my voice is called to do. And Lord, I would just ask that they would live in to that calling. If there's anyone that doesn't know what that is, Lord, I pray alongside of them that you would just speak into their hearts and into their minds. Lord, I just ask that you would do an incredible work through each person, through whatever crazy thing you've asked us to do, that we would say yes and that we would be loyal and faithful to the message that you've given. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching this message with me. If you want to see more, make sure you hit the subscribe button and go the bell and be notified so when we go live or post a new video. We'd also like to invite you to join us in person for a service. Please visit us at desertgrace.org or give us a call at 928-305-1132 for more information. Thank you.